Let's take a look at how the Beatles' first success in America uh, unfolded for them in their career and what that meant for their music and for their, um, for their, uh, their really their ability to sort of um, uh, uh, change and affect the popular music world in so many of the ways that they did. Um, as I was talking about last week, um, Capital Records in Los Angeles was the label that was in, it was a subsidiary of EMI. It was owned by EMI in UK. And of course, Parlophone, the label that the Beatles recorded for um, uh, in the UK, was also uh, an EMI uh, uh, a company. And so it would have seemed the easiest thing in the world for Capital to release these Beatles recordings in 1963 when they were having all the hits. But Capital wouldn't do that. We'll come back, come back to that in just a minute. But what's important about 1964 is that the, at the very end of 63, they decided they would release I Want to Hold Your Hand. It was released in late December 1963, but uh, in order to sell the record, they figured they had to mount a pretty good publicity campaign because, as we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, British groups had not had tremendous success in this country, and so they knew it, what they thought it was going to be a real uh, challenge. So they, they mounted a big uh, publicity campaign, the Beatles are coming, the Beatles are coming. They released I Want to Hold Your Hand with all the resources of uh, distribution, radio distribution, distribution in the United States, and the ability to get um, a radio, uh, uh, this song played on the radio. Uh, it became a hit. By the end of January 1964, it was at the top of the American uh, charts. Fortuitously for the Beatles, it just turns out that um, they had previously booked themselves to appear on the Ed Sullivan Show on February the 9th. In fact, Brian Epstein booked them for three weeks in a row starting on Sunday, February the 9th, 1964. And so just at about the time they came for their big, their first big television performance um, in, the, in, in early February, they had a number one hit record in this country. How uh, convenient. So you talk about something happening overnight. It wasn't exactly over, overnight, but in the course of about six weeks uh, between the, the car, the, the, I want to hold your hand rising in the charts and the Beatles appearing on Ed Sullivan, uh, they really did make a fantastic impression and broke through in this country like no UK act uh, had ever uh, done. Just to give you an idea of how big that first rush of Beatlemania uh, was in the United States, they had multiple uh, Many of their UK singles and album tracks were re-released in the US so that uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand um, uh, uh, had success. All of a sudden there was really two whole albums plus singles worth of UK material that hadn't been released in this country. There was just a flood of it onto the market uh, both by, by Capital and by VJ who you may remember um, uh, owned, owned the rights to distribute some of this stuff. So uh, you got She Loves You going to number one. I Want to Hold Your Hand had already gone to number one. Please Please Me uh, went to number three. I Saw Her Standing There went to number 14. In fact, if we just take a snapshot of the Beatles' success picture, on April the 4th of 1964, the Billboard uh, pop chart had, beat, the Beatles had 12 singles on the Billboard chart. They had positions number one, two, three, four, five. The top five positions were all Beatles singles on the chart, plus 31, 41, 46, 58, 65, 68, and 79. They had the top two albums in the country, Meet the Beatles on Capitol, and Introducing the Beatles on VJ. Uh, so it probably hasn't been since Elvis Presley that the pop music business had seen such a, such a gigantic, overwhelming uh, uh, kind of success as the Beatles had in that uh, first rush. Now, let's get back to talking about why it is that Capital didn't see this, why it took the fifth Beatles UK hit for them to sort of get the idea that maybe they would sell records in the U.S. Well, uh, the Capital idea that British artists just can't sell in this country uh, might have been wrong in the case of the Beatles, but it was well reasoned on the, um, on the evidence of the way things had unfolded during the last 10 years. Now it's true there had been some uh, UK artists who had big hits in America, but they were, I wouldn't exactly say like a fluke, but they were very few. We've already talked about Lonnie Donegan's Rock Island Line going to number eight in this country in 1956. Uh, we could add a pop song, though not rock and roll by any of the stretch of the imagination, by Acker, Bilt, uh, Acker Bilk called Stranger on the Shore. That went to number one in 1962. And an interesting precursor to the Beatles is the song Telstar, an instrumental 
called Telstar by a group called the Tornadoes. They actually uh, had been the backing band for Billy Fury, who you remember has a Liverpool connection because uh, one of the Larry Parnes artists that coming out of Liverpool. That went to number one in this country and number one in the UK in 1962, produced by Joe Meek, uh, who's uh, these days thought of as a sort of overlooked but very important uh, English uh, record producer uh, from the, uh, the first part of the 1960s. So Telstar, uh, a, big, uh, a big record there. But Without, be, besides those, there weren't a lot of British artists on the pop charts. Um, and it wasn't just Capital that thought that. The Beatles themselves believed this. Um, they told Brian Epstein, we won't go to the U.S. unless we have a hit record there. Because they had seen other British artists, or heard about other British artists going to the U.S. and having big hits in the U.K. and getting absolutely nowhere with their careers in the U.S. The best example of that is Cliff Richard. During the period of 1958 through 1963, Cliff Richard had 27 hit singles in the U.K., but he could not get a significant hit record in the U.S. during that period of time. He was as big as a British artist could possibly be in the period immediately preceding the Beatles, yet he couldn't really couldn't break the ice here uh, in, uh, uh, in the U.S. And so the Beatles didn't want to do that. They figure if Cliff can't get a hit, uh, how are they going to do it? So they told Brian Epstein, you know, if we don't have um, a hit, um, we're not going to go uh, to the U.S. So as it turns out, uh, when the Beatles found out that they had a hit, on Capitol Records uh, in January of 1964. They were actually in France playing a series of theater shows in Paris for what was probably an audience maybe a little bit older and more tuxedo clad than the usual kinds of kids that they saw at the Cavern Club uh, in Liverpool just a couple of years earlier. Why were they there? They were trying to build a French following. They already had a big, a big thing going in the UK, so they were, they were thinking about the continent. And so they were, they, were, they were playing this series of gigs in France, in Paris, hoping to sort of establish themselves in the French pop scene. At the same time, they, if they were doing that, they were going to a studio where Brian Epstein and George Martin had the idea that what they needed to do was take the lyrics from She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand and do them again but in German so they could sell records on the German pop market because of course my Bonnie and all of that had had happened just uh, not too not too much uh, uh, before this and so the idea in their minds was they had this this uh, this single being released in America but they were working on building their French following and their German following of course when everything worked out the way it did in the United States that the what they were trying to do with French and Germany at the time didn't really matter because this eclipsed all that and engulfed it and really it became something uh, so much bigger. So how is it that they ended up on the Ed Sullivan show just at the time this, this uh, well, I Want to Hold Your Hand was being released uh, by Capitol and going to the top of the charts? Well, this all seems to go back to an incident late October, early November, when Ed Sullivan or one of his representatives was delayed at Heathrow Airport because the Beatles were coming back from a trip um, to appear on television, one of those shows, uh, Sunday, Sunday Night at the London Palladium or the Royal Command Performance. And the, the, there were so many fans on the tarmac uh, when the Beatles plane came and they had to temporarily ground all flights because they were afraid one of these kids was going to get hurt. Uh, and so um, either Sullivan or one of his representatives uh, were sitting on one of those planes, wanting to know what was going on, they got it explained to him. It was one of these. It was a. It was a British pop group, and they saw. They saw the mania themselves, and so this gave Brian Epstein a little bit of an inside track to get the group booked on the Ed Sullivan Show. He booked them in an unprecedented three weeks as headliners. Now, as it turns out, they did other shows when they were in this country. They played one in D.C. I think they played a, a show in Carnegie Hall. But basically, they played the Sullivan Show on February the 9th, and then they took a trip down to Miami. Ed Sullivan always liked to do a couple weeks of his show in Miami during the, uh, during the winter time, and why not? Uh, and so they went down and they did the next week in Miami and then filmed yet a third performance, which was then aired uh, the week after that. So three weeks in a row, they headlined the Ed Sullivan Show. One biographer says that Brian Epstein did this entire trip at a loss. He used his family resources to underwrite this entire thing, and there was no way that the amount of money they made from those shows actually paid 
for the, for the expenses of it. And so he went out of pocket uh, to put this thing on. But a pretty uh, good investment because these, these Ed Sullivan shows uh, and the records and, and all this thing that exploded uh, really ended up paying off uh, big time uh, for everybody. Might be, uh, as we think about this Ed Sullivan show thing, a good time to point out, and I, I think I mentioned this last week as well, that Beatles gear uh, made a big difference. That is, the kinds of guitars and drums the Beatles were playing uh, actually uh, increased sales for the companies. So, for example, after the Beatles uh, performed on Ed Sullivan, uh, fans were buying up uh, Beatles gear. So people wanted to have a Gretsch guitar like George Harrison was playing. He was playing a, a Chet Atkins Country Gentleman model. Uh, John Lennon had a Rickenbacker guitar, a, a Rickenbacker 325. Um, Paul McCartney had a Hofner bass, that famous violin or viola-shaped bass uh, that you often see him with. Ringo had Ludwig drums, and you can clearly see the Ludwig uh, 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 logo just above the big Beatles logo on his, on his uh, bass drum. You couldn't see the Vox guitar amps on Ed Sullivan, but it came to be known that they were playing Vox guitar amps. Um, and then as we get into uh, talking about A Hard Day's Night, we'll see that the jingle jangle of George Harrison's Rickenbacker 12-string guitar made a very big difference as well. And so for the e even music Musical instrument companies experienced a boom because of the success uh, of the Beatles uh, on Ed Sullivan and all of us. People wanted to have guitars uh, just like the Beatles. In fact, George Harrison loves to tell a story. I don't know how true it is, but he tells it in the Beatles anthology that uh, statistics were that during the time the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show that first night, February 9th, crime in the city of New York was actually went down significantly. So as George liked to say, even the criminals stopped for a minute to watch the Beatles. Well, whether or not that's true or just a fun story, uh, uh, who knows. But uh, as we head into the next lecture, we'll see how the Beatles tried to capitalize on that success by going into the movies. The next lecture being the Beatles in the movies.